Good morning, everybody. Uh, <laughs> this is today's January 12th, 2012. I am here with my very good friend and colleague, Professor Frank DiSalvo, who is the John Newman Professor of Physical Sciences and Director of the Atkinson Center for Sustainable Future. Um, I would say that I've probably known Frank that longer than I should acknowledge. Uh, I've known Frank since he came here to Cornell uh, a little over 20 years ago. Um, and we have been very close collaborators almost since the day he got here. Um, the intent today is to sort of reminisce about Frank's, uh, let's say, scientific history and how he got into science, his evolution through the sciences to his current interest in uh, sustainability as a global problem and enterprise. Uh, but without going any further, let's say hello to Frank. Hi, Tito. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've uh, been here actually almost 26 years now, okay. so time goes by fast, doesn't it? Yeah, I've been here just a little bit longer than you've been here. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, in order to sort of get the conversation started, um, since Frank is probably a little too humble, I mean, he's an extraordinarily accomplished scientist, member of the National Academy of Sciences, member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and has gotten basically every award there is to get in the field of solid state chemistry and solid state physics. Um, I've collaborated with Frank over many years in development of catalysts for fuel cells and, and other areas. And so, um, as I mentioned, uh, Frank is an extremely accomplished scientist. Uh, but what we want to chat about today is more on sort of the human interest aspects. And so for starts, how did you get into science? <laughs> I guess everybody's story begins with their parents. So my father was an engineer. My mother was a teacher. She taught reading. Um, both had a, a significant influence on my early life. I'm the oldest of seven children, so I got a lot of attention when I was young. As more and more <laughs> children came along, I got less attention, but by then I was very interested already in, in uh, how things worked and uh, taking things apart. My father had a workshop at home uh, and I was always down there trying to do things. In fact, uh, or undo eventually things. undo things. <laughs> in fact, he put a padlock on the on the door because I often would go down and take tools and take them out in the woods to do things, and then leave them out there, and they would end up rusty from a rainstorm or something. But my father had, uh, in retrospect, enormous patience with all of that. Although he did get pretty irritated with some of those things. Uh, in my neighborhood, uh, growing up. Uh, north of Boston, there were two ham radio operators. They were just a couple doors on either side. And one in particular had a basement full of electronic junk that uh, he was always trying to get rid of uh, because his wife uh, was upset that the house was covered with all this electronic equipment. And so uh, he was kind enough uh, to let me come over with my wagon, uh, come into his basement, and we would rummage through stuff and he would load up my wagon with things like Tesla coils and two kilowatt power supplies and all of this kind of stuff. And you didn't was, kill yourself? I, was, I almost <laughs> did. I have scars on this hand from getting caught across the two kilowatt, two kilovolt power supply uh, with one hand. And uh, I can tell you that completely paralyzes you when that's going through your hand. Uh, I'm sure. And I, I, uh, I felt like I was on there forever probably was 10 or 20 seconds, and then I fell backwards. Fortunately, I was on a rubber mat, um, so I, I didn't have anything flowing except through, through the finger, and I still have a scar from that that was cauterized, that burned all the way down to the bone. I could see the bone. And I just put a, I just put a tape over it, and I didn't tell my parents, because I knew if I told my parents that they were gonna forbid me from, from using this stuff <laughs> anymore. <laughs> uh, so it was a lot of those kinds of early influences, uh, I think. I also had an uncle my mother's youngest brother, who uh, was interested in things like fireworks or anything that was spectacular. And so I got interested in all sort of branches of science, things that would explode or burn, uh, you know, anything electronic. Um, my, and my father was an aeronautical engineer. So all of those, and, and the ham radio operators in the neighborhood had, had a big influence on me. In high, in high school, 
I had a very good chemistry teacher, had a lousy physics teacher, uh, but the chemistry teacher uh, really stoked further my interest in science. So those, those are the ways I got started. Probably everybody has a story some sure. of, of who yeah. helped employee. you get going, and then early that's mine. Early on, for sure. That's yeah. right. And so I very can also early. see where your interest in explosion <coughs> comes in for the audience. Whenever Frank teaches freshman chemistry, every lecture there's at least one explosion. At least <laughs> one, right. Ex exactly. That's intended. I don't know. That's right. <laughs> that might not be an intention. Well, I do that actually because I think large lectures, uh, it's really hard to keep everybody's attention. The kids are uh, sleep deprived. Uh, it's, when it's cold outside, they come in with a lot of warm clothes on. They sit down. They're going to be asleep in the first 20 minutes for sure, if not 10 minutes. Uh, and so I actually took up uh, inserting a commercial break into the middle of lecture where I would take five minutes and tell a story and blow something up. And that would get everybody riled up and get their blood moving <laughs> and then they were ready to, to learn for the next 20 minutes or so. So uh, I've, I've used that, uh, I think, pretty effectively in, in my teaching. Okay, I always know when you're teaching freshman chemistry because there's you know, the whole building rattles. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Any other sort of interesting <clears throat> vignettes from the early days, you know, grade school and high school? Well, I, uh, in high school, I, uh, I competed in the science fair competition things. I don't even know if high schools still have those anymore, but th they were pretty popular at that time. Since we lived north of Boston, and my last <coughs> science project I undertook was extremely ambitious. I decided I was going to build a cyclotron. Now, <laughs> what I knew about a cyclotron was not much, <laughs> but it sounded like a good idea to you me. You had a good experience with uh, it to kill a so, power supply. <laughs> so, so uh, well, because I'd, I'd been a, uh, I eventually became a ham radio operator, so I knew something about circuits and, you know, I could, I could make oscillating electric fields. I, m I managed to uh, talk a lot of people into giving me things for this, so I got a, a, a vacuum pump from somebody, uh, I got, uh, big chunks of steel for building a magnet and uh, and I uh, got some people to do some welding to build a vacuum chamber. Uh, this was small, it was not very big uh, and now I realize it, of course it didn't work uh, because it was only a mechanical pump vacuum and when I put the RF field on the, the, the uh, gas um, ionized and glowed so it looked impressive and uh, if none of the people that were judging the science competition I think w w knew enough to, to, to be to able to say to me this working. is working but, <laughs> but it looked impressive because it was glowing and you know and all these things were happening but the magnet I ended up building uh, I went to the magnet lab at MIT and talked to an engineer there Bruce Montgomery who was in charge of uh, the, all the magnets at the magnet lab and he always got requests about building magnets and how you build them from students and so on and so I was one and went in to see him and he gave me good advice about how to build a magnet and then said you know why don't you come to work with me for the summer so this was the summer between my senior year and my entering MIT in the fall although at that point I don't think I knew I maybe I hadn't even applied to MIT but I don't think I had been accepted at that point because that was much earlier in the year uh, he said, why don't you come to work with me for the summer and we'll write a little pamphlet on how to build a magnet that I can just give to people so I don't spend a lot of time doing all of that. So I did. I took the summer job at, at MIT at the Magnet Lab and went in uh, every day, started the first two weeks with Bruce the building magnets, trying to build magnets and write something. And one day he came in and said to me, he said, you know, he said, uh, this might be useful, but I got something much more interesting, and I think we should work on that instead. And what was more interesting was he had uh, what were called uh, uh, hard superconductors, uh, niobium zirconium alloy, which was one of the first uh, materials that could carry electric current as a superconducting material at, at fairly high magnetic fields. So they were trying to build superconducting magnets at the time and trying to understand why it was that when you had a small piece of superconducting wire that you could carry very high current, but if you wound it into a long coil and made a, a magnet, it would carry much less current um, and before it quenched and became normal. And so we instead spent the summer trying to understand this, this effect with, uh, with little magnets. I can't remember whether we ever really uh, found anything out or, or I don't remember 
what the conclusions were from those particular experiments. Um, but I worked then my freshman year at MIT, I worked at the Magnet Lab through freshman year for 10 or 15 hours a week and, uh, and got paid, which I thought was, was pretty neat. Uh, it gave me a little bit of pin money to, to have while I was uh, running around. And then uh, I talked to, to Bruce about uh, continuing to work with him that summer, but I told him that I, I, needed, uh, I needed money because uh, you know, my, my, even though my father was an engineer with, with, uh, with a large family, it was clear he wasn't going to be able to spend a lot of money on, uh, on college. So he said, well, you know, if you really need money, you don't want to work at MIT. I said, why is that? He said, because MIT pays the students too little money. You won't earn very much if you stay here and work. He said, you should go to work for a company. And I said, well, what company? He said, well, there's a lot of startup companies and other companies around the Boston area. But one in particular, he said, was a company called Avco Everett. And they were, uh, they were built up by an MIT professor, Arthur Kanterwitz, who was a plasma physicist, as I recall. And he founded Avco Everett, uh, connected with the space program. Remember uh, the reentry problem of getting right. up into space? Right. He's the one that invented the ablation shield, so that as you came down into the atmosphere, <coughs> the, heat was, yeah. the heat was absorbed by the shield, and the shield would melt and that, take that material away, and then there'd be new material. And that's, that was the genesis of Avco Everett. But he was interested in, among other things, what was called magnetohydrodynamic power generation. Mm -hmm. so you, uh, and for that, you needed large volumes with big magnetic fields. So superconductors was the game, and they had a big, they had a fairly large effort on building large superconducting magnets. He sent me over there, Bruce Montgomery did, to see if I could get a summer job, and I got a job there. I worked there all through my undergraduate years uh, at MIT, worked there in the summers, uh, even did my undergraduate thesis at Avco Everett. Uh, I got paid for it, even though that was against the rules at MIT. So you, you weren't supposed to get paid for doing your thesis. So in principle, MIT could take my degree away because I got paid to do my uh, thesis. Uh, there we go. So, now we have dirt. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> that turned out to be important because in my senior year, my wife Barbara and I got married. So we needed, uh, we needed money. money. So I was, I was getting paid pretty well. In fact, after my first year of graduate school at Stanford, uh, instead of starting to work in the laboratory, I went back to Avco Everett for the summer. Uh, I was paid full-time engineer's salary for the three months in the summer, and that gave us a, a, good, a good cushion to, to be living on, uh, because in our, our first year of graduate school, our first daughter, Pamela, was born. So uh, even though we didn't have very much money, we think of it as a, as a, as a very good time. We were, both, we were both very busy with school and, and kids eventually, mm -hmm. both two kids, Pam and Kate. Uh, so I could never have predicted the path that I went on. I went to, to MIT intending to be a chemist, by the way. I was going to go back to that because you mentioned that <coughs> initially because of your experience in high school right. and the sort of inspiring teacher that you had that you wanted to be a chemistry major, but then there was this little thing called organic chemistry. <laughs> Yeah, I, I took freshman chemistry, which I really enjoyed. Uh, and then, I think it was May of freshman year, I went up to the organic lab to talk to students and see what organic was going to be like. This was on the top floor of the chemistry building. It was in a room with, uh, as near as I could tell, no venting. There was one the hood, may <laughs> yeah, maybe one hood, and all this organic chemistry was going on and all these open beakers out in the lab, and the lab smelled awful. So I went in and I, started talking to the student and after about five or ten minutes I had a headache and I knew it was from what I was smelling because I don't get headaches even today I never get headaches maybe once every ten years if I get sick that's it so I knew this was a reaction to something and I just turned around and walked out of the room and said this is nuts why would anybody try to make a living doing this <laughs> and so at that point I switched into electrical engineering because I had been a ham radio operator I thought right, I could do that sure. but then in my junior year was taking a course we were doing Fourier and Laplace transforms on circuits and, Ooh, uh, and other other <laughs> sure. other things and uh, and it hit me right you know, after doing a month of this that if I had to do this for the rest of my life I'd be bored silly so I thought I better change my major and uh, the 
I thought, I, I went to the books and said, I, I gotta graduate on time. I, I, I tried to see what course could, could I still graduate in with what I'd taken, uh, and it turned out to be physics. So I said, okay, I'll be a physicist. <laughs> That's how I ended up with a physics degree. Um, and then I was not gonna go to graduate school because as I mentioned, I was married and uh, was just gonna get a job. I already had a job at Avco Everett. I could have stayed there, I think, as an engineer. Um, but one of my professors told me, you know, if you go to graduate school, uh, you don't have to pay anything. In fact, you get paid. Uh, and there are these graduate fellowships. Uh, in particular, there was one he thought might be appropriate because he, at that time, I, uh, I was a, about to get married and he said, um, he said, there's this fellowship that pays you more if you're married and pays you more if you have children. That was an NSF, it was called an NSF traineeship. They don't exist anymore. Uh, it was very enlightened because it was Sputnik time and they wanted to get people to come back to university for graduate education and they thought, well, there's all these people with families, they're not going to be able to leave unless they can get paid more money. It was also the early stages <coughs> of NSF, right? The early it was years. very early years. So this was, uh, this was 1966. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, it, so I figured, well, I might as well apply. And I applied uh, and, and got such a fellowship at Stanford in physics. So, I, so we went to Stanford. Um, then you didn't visit the graduate schools you were gonna apply to, at least especially if they were cross country because it was way too expensive. They sent little booklets around with pictures of what it looked like and all of that. So, so uh, we went to Stanford, uh, accepted and whatever, sight unseen. And uh, furthest west I'd ever been in my life till that point was Buffalo, New York. Yeah. <laughs> furthest west Barbara had ever been <laughs> was Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> uh, so we, uh, we get to California, it was a huge shock because we had kind of the Easterners early television stereotypical view of what California was gonna be like. And uh, which was that everybody ran around in bathing suits with surfboards and spent most of their time at the beach. Flip flops. And <laughs> so when we looked at the map, we saw Palo Alto at the south end of San Francisco Bay. And we said, wow, we're gonna be right at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Little did we know that the south end of San Francisco Bay was a swamp and at that time it was the Palo Alto dump at the, right at the edge of the swamp. And so, uh, and we thought of the wide open west and we got to the Bay Area and, and houses were even closer together than they were in New England and, and, uh, and it was hot. It was mid-September and it was 95 degrees and I'd never been anywhere where the humidity was so low. My throat was dry down to my belly button for the first week, I think. I couldn't drink enough water. It took a while to adapt. But uh, I think back now it's kind of funny how naive and, uh, and at the same time how hopeful we were about everything. I mean, uh, different times also, and, and it was a very optimistic time. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. yeah. And, and throughout the country, and right. the idea of sort of renewal, you know, after the war, and all of these other things. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned also that you started as a theorist in graduate school. Oh. <laughs> How did that come about? So I'm in the physics department, and I I started looking for a thesis advisor. I actually, looked late because I spent that first summer in, back, back in, at, in, uh, in Boston. Boston. And so I started looking when I got back. Um, those people that I thought I wanted to work with said they didn't have any money or their group was full or whatever. And those uh, that I didn't want to work with who had plenty of money, I, some of them I vowed I would never work with. One was notorious for keeping students nine or 10 years and I being married and, and with kids and whatever, I wasn't interested in that. So, um, so I, I had a, a very good teacher who taught the, uh, sort of applied mathematics or theoretical physics side of things, Sandy Fetter. Uh, he was a condensed matter theorist. And uh, so I went and talked to him and uh, he said, well, okay, why don't you, why don't you, uh, you know, try working with me? So I tried. I got a desk in his, uh, in his group's area and uh, I sat at that desk for about a month uh, trying to think of things to do and playing around with equations and whatever. And, I was getting, uh, I was getting very, I was getting very antsy sitting, just sitting at a table all day long trying to push a pencil. It just didn't, it just didn't fit with me. I'm a very hands-on person. I like doing that stuff. So I went and saw him after a month, and I said, I don't think this is going to work. Uh, 
you know, I, I, it's just driving me crazy sitting behind a desk. Uh, I would have made a terrible theorist, by the way. I, mean, I now understand that. So it's a, it's a good thing that I was feeling antsy. Uh, so he said, you know, there is this new fellow that showed up here at Stanford in the applied physics department named Ted Jabal. And Ted had spent 17 years at Bell Labs and moved back to California it's where he was born. to how long you were there, right? Yeah, so uh, there's so some mirrors in my life to, to, to his life. Uh, he's 92 right now. Uh, but he moved to Bell Labs, uh, from Bell Labs to Stanford uh, just in my second year uh, of graduate school. So I went to see him and he, he's, he's a, he was trained as a physical chemist, but he was interested in superconductivity, in particular finding new superconductors. And his lab was, was sort of an empty shell when I went to see him and I thought, wow, I can start to build things, I can do, and so I joined his group. Uh, that was so you were his first student? I was actually the second one to join his group. I was the first one to graduate from the group, the second one to join the group. And there was a postdoc also that had, had joined the group, Rick Green, uh, was, was still a good friend. Uh, anyway, the, uh, the transferring to work with Ted was not as easy as it would be nowadays, or certainly not as easy as it is at Cornell, because the applied physics department had grown out of the physics department, not as a growth, but as a secessionary movement. Yeah. As a, and and the, there was a huge animosity uh, between the, all, the, all the faculty participants. And so I was told as a physics graduate student that I had to resign from the physics department and take my chances that applied physics would accept me. So they, they, uh, they were not being helpful in switching departments or whatever. But anyway, the switch, the switch went off and uh, and things went very well with Ted, and then I went to Bell Labs. So it was a, uh, I, I, couldn't have, uh, I couldn't have plotted the path from early interest in chemistry to electrical engineering to physics to applied physics back to chemistry through materials, through trying to make new superconductors. That path was a, was a very oddball pathway. In fact, most of my life, I would say, has, has not been planned, has ended up going in directions that I never would have <laughs> expected. Like, I think uh, like <coughs> for most people, you know, that's basically the same, right. the same scheme. So you went to Bell at uh, what year? In 1971. Uh, that, was a, that was a very bad year. That was a recession year, and uh, there wasn't much hiring going on. Uh, so I was very lucky to get a job there. The, the research division at Bell Labs usually hired about 50 people a year. Uh, that year they hired five. And I was very lucky to, to get a position because there was a physicist that was leaving Bell Labs, a Swiss physicist, to go back to a position in Switzerland. And he had a laboratory uh, uh, that uh, did some synthesis but mostly physical measurements on materials. Mm -hmm. And was a he was a collaborator with a whole bunch of people at the labs and they wanted someone to be there to keep those collaborations I see. going. I see. And uh, because I'd been doing various kinds of physical measurements and some chemistry on superconductors, in fact, a lot of chemistry on superconductors, um, I ended up being lucky in getting hired at Bell Labs. Uh, and that, that was a, a real stroke of luck for me because it was a great time at Bell Labs. It was a terrific time to be there. I was there from 71 to 86, and it was a very academic-like laboratory. Sure. But you didn't have to, com there was no grants. You didn't have to write grant proposals, didn't have to teach, didn't have to be on committees. You just did science all day long. And it was a kind of anarchy of ideas. Uh, you weren't directed by your department head about what to do. It was your responsibility to figure it out. But you didn't get a lot of resources. I had one technician in a small lab. So to accomplish almost anything, you had to collaborate. And that's where I really learned the power of collaboration and, sure. and of talking to people in other disciplines who know things that you don't. Um, in doing that, you can learn a heck of a lot. Quickly. Uh, also. And you can, you can learn it quickly because Bell Labs was full of experts. Okay. And the, uh, if you wanted to know anything, people were glad to talk to you. So you could very quickly get up to speed, right up to the forefront of where things were by talking to people. When I first went there, uh, in fact, the day I was entering, there was somebody retiring from Bell Labs, and for some reason I ended up going to a little reception 
that was held for him. His name was Rudy Kompfner. Uh, Rudy, uh, then you had to retire at 65, so he was 65. He grew up in Austria. He had a, a degree, he was an architect in Austria, but got out of Austria when the Nazis took over because uh, he had, I don't know, a grandmother or something that was Jewish. Went to England, tried to practice architecture, but nobody would hire him because he didn't have an English degree. So he thought he should go back to school and somehow, I don't know how this transpired, but he ended up going to Cambridge University and got a PhD in physics from, from architecture. From architecture. From architecture. And after the war, uh, he was hired by Bell Labs. There were always some English scientists from Cambridge at Bell Labs and they would go back recruiting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he got hired and uh, he came over and he fancied himself, he said, if you asked him, you know, what kind of scientist are you? He'd say, I'm not a scientist, I'm an inventor. Um, he, so he wouldn't give you any clue. He had like about 150 patents wow. on uh, all kinds of things. He invented the traveling wave tube and so on. But to make a long story short, he, uh, he told me that day, he said, you know, whenever you are thinking about something, it's very important to go talk to the experts. He said, because 95% of the time they're right. He said, if you can figure out the 5% of the time that they're wrong, you're going to have a fantastic career. And that's ba basically what he did. He would go around, talk to people and say, you know, I wonder if you could do this. And that, all the experts would tell him no. And he'd think about it and he'd say, you know, maybe I can and he'd try it. And that's, that's how he became very famous that way. But the, Bell Labs was full of people like this that just I had mean, in some very sense, interesting you know, Bell backgrounds. Bell Labs was almost a singularity in the history of science in this country. I think so. I mean, it was, I mean, without a doubt, you know, the best condensed matter physics lab probably in the world. I, I certainly believe that. And, and it's unfortunate it was, that it was it terrific for me. Yeah. It was terrific for me. As a young scientist, you're eager, you want to learn, um, you're, uh, it's playing all day long in the sandbox, and you get paid for it. Wow, that was terrific. <laughs> and, and, and certainly in those days, which was sort of really at the heyday of Bell Labs with, you know, extremely effervescent environment, you know, I remember knowing a number of people there as well. And so in that, you know, being in, in, in such an environment, what prompted you to come to Cornell from Bell Labs? Ah, uh, that's another interesting story. Let's see, at Bell Labs, I, I've said many things in my life that I that made pronouncements that I wouldn't do this or I would do that, but, and it turned out to be precisely wrong. So when I first went to Bell Labs, I said, I'm going to be a scientist. I don't want to be a manager. I want to spend all my time in the lab. And uh, Wrong, 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 wrong. <laughs> I, I got there. I think the first week I was there, I, I was interviewed by uh, Al Clogston who was a theorist, but he was an executive director. That was like three no. levels up. 500 PhDs reported to him in the research Jeez. division. Uh, the reason I got an interview with him was that he was a good friend of my thesis advisor, Ted Jabal. Ted Jabal. So, uh, so he asked me to come to his office. And here I'm a brash new, wet behind the ears kid. And, uh, and I, I knew something about what Al had done as a scientist. And now as a manager, he wasn't doing scientist, science anymore at that level. Um, so I went into his office and pretty quickly I, I looked at him and I said, not in so many words, but here's, here's what I said, <laughs> implied. <laughs> I said, Al, you're a smart guy. You're a brilliant scientist. How can you be so dumb as to give all that up to sit behind a desk and push paper? <laughs> and, uh, nice starting he, salvo yeah, here. He, so, he, so he rhetorically reached out and patted me on my head. And he said to me, he said, well, at some point in my career, it became apparent that I could either follow the rules or I could make the rules. He said, I'd rather make the <laughs> rules. <laughs> so a little, a little later in my career, after eight years at Bell Labs, I had the chance to become a department head. And uh, I, I did that with a, with a very wise director. He asked me to, to take the job just for two years to see if I liked it. Um, and I said, okay, he said, well, make it public. It's just two years. Um, in fact, we'll call it a research head. And if you don't like it, go back to the lab. He said, uh, if you do like it, he said, it's great uh, and, and whatever. He said, but uh, it's, it's certainly more money, but, but don't just do it for the money because he said, golden handcuffs are handcuffs nonetheless. Yes. And, and said, uh, 
So anyway, I ended up being department head of three different departments over the time that I'd been department head well, at no Bell Labs. And so the first one I started with was the uh, chemical physics uh, department. I had some, a number of electrochemists in the department. Uh -huh. It was my first learning of electrochemistry. Sure. Uh, I mean, they, were, they had a big, you know, very strong group there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, so I learned a lot from them. And then I became the head of the solid state chemistry department. And then after that, I switched to another division, became head of the solid state physics department. Um, so, uh, and then, then, then I came to Bell Labs. So, I mean, came, came to Cornell. I came to Cornell. To get to your question now, how did I end up coming here? <laughs> So having violated, having violated saying I would never be a manager and whatever, um, at the time I came here, or so was I'll never came, be a university professor. Is that I had one? said that. I'm never gonna, not okay. going to be a university professor. I, I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to do something that really matters in the world that's going to affect people that will make products and make jobs and all of this you know kind of stuff. You know what you say, right? I will never die. I will never die. I should <laughs> so try that. I should try that and see what happens. <laughs> I was going to say, so far so good, right? <laughs> <That's a laughs> um, so, uh, my predecessor here was Mike Sienko. He was a solid state chemist. Him, yeah. Solid state chemist. He was very uh, well known, very terrific teacher, very well known for his teaching and for his freshman chemistry text, which he wrote with Bob Plain. I think they published it in at least a half a dozen editions. I think it was the most published freshman chemistry text ever. It was published in 25 languages around the world. I actually have copies in, I have in, many in copies. Spanish and different, yeah, different yeah. languages. Yeah. I, have a, I have a number of those copies. Anyway, he was a solid state chemist. I knew him quite well. In fact, we, uh, were, the families were friends. We had spent time here uh, at his house. Yeah. Uh, we'd spent some time on vacation with him in France. He was a real Francophile. Right. I spent two months every summer in France. Um, I gave, I gave some seminars in his group and things of that sort. A lot of them like Sienko stories, but that would take us so far. Anyway, um, he died in 1983 of lung cancer. And uh, sometime after he died, Roald Hoffman was chair, and Roald called me chair, up. Right. He, I came in 83, and Roald was chair, and he right. hired me. Yeah. So Roald called me up and said, we're forming a small external committee to give us advice about uh, seeing if we can hire a, a solid state chemist because we think we should keep doing that. Um, would you be on that committee? I said, fine. Uh, you know, nominate names and so, you know, I sent him names and whatever. And one day he called me up, he said, well, how would you like to be considered for the position? And I said, no, I'm perfectly happy at Bell Labs and, and whatever. So he said, okay. Six months later he called me up and he said, you know, I, I, I know you're not interested, but why don't, you, why don't you just come up and give a seminar and talk to people? And so I thought, well, I guess I could do that. And by the time I got up here, I was in one of those phases that happens about every 10 years <laughs> where you think to yourself, what, what do I, I really want to do when I grow up? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, I thought, well, well, let's go talk. And so I talked, and one thing led to another. I thought, okay, well, why don't I give it a try? And I thought, I was arrogant enough at the time to think, if. I'll try it out. If it doesn't work, I'll just go back and manage science and industry or something like that. Little did I know that science and <laughs> industry was about to disappear. Um, <clears throat> or mainly the, the main corporate research laboratories were going to disappear in almost every case. Anyway, I came here and, uh, you know, here it is 26 years later. The only thing I didn't understand in, in the end really was not uh, writing grants and getting money. I, I didn't really have uh, too, too much difficulty with that. In fact, I don't think I had any difficulty with that. I had underestimated the effort it takes to teach if you're going to do a good job at it. I uh, think most people don't have a clear understanding. Yeah. And when, say, you know, when, when I tell people, well, mm -hmm. I teach a course a semester, three of, and what else do you do for the rest, you know, for the other 30 some odd hours, you know? Yeah. Like they think that it's just showing up, you know, for 45 minutes and that's it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's well, an enormous. Most people's view of teaching uh, comes from high school and they assume that college is pretty much like high school. Even undergraduates at Cornell, I don't think have a good grasp of what faculty members actually do with yeah. most of their time. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I think that first year was a shock because I, uh, was putting in about eight hours preparing a lecture that was going to last 50 minutes uh, in whatever course it was I was teaching at the time. 
And, uh, you know, my, my attitude coming here was, well, I know this stuff, what's, what's the big deal? But as soon as I realized that you had to connect to the students where they were at, and then lead them logically from one step to the next and build, the, build this up as a facade yeah, so that sticks together, uh, a lot of the things that you sort of used and remembered, you, you didn't really remember where the connections were or why they were connected or you didn't, you didn't have to think about that at the right. time, but when you're trying to teach, you had to think about that. So that was the big shock in coming here. And again, I said when I came here, well, I've, I've done this managing thing, so I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to be a department head. I'm not going to be a center director. I'm not going to do any of that stuff. Um, and of course, Cornell was one of the universities, one of the first universities to really get engaged with building centers in a big way, especially in the sciences. Um, the uh, CCMR, which I think was just called MSC the at the MSC time. at the yeah, time, Material, yeah, Science, Material Science, Science Center. Center. Right which was initially funded by DARPA, or ARPA, was, as it was at the time, in 1961, I think, um, had built itself to a, quite a formidable center in terms of the people that were engaged with it, the facilities they had, uh, and the resources that they had. Uh, at, that, at that time, in 86, by then, the, the center had been transferred to NSF. The, all these research centers that were funded by ARPA uh, had to DMR. transition to, to NSF. That founded DMR, by the way. That right. was the foundation of DMR, was getting those centers. They didn't, because NSF didn't have centers up till then, and they didn't really know what to do with centers. Uh, nonetheless, the funding, even in 1986 when I came here for... That was Herb Johnson was the director? No, Herb had, had uh, just out? stepped down, okay. and it was uh, Bob Silsby. Okay. Uh, so they had enough money then uh, that they were a big contributor to startup packages for materials people. Uh, and so I had a fair amount of startup money from uh, CC, what is now CCMR. Uh, and the, uh, I just had a conversation with Peter Lepage about that. There, essentially none of the centers can do that anymore. And it's, it's, a, it's a big problem in how do you put together startup packages on campus. But nonetheless, uh, I said, you know, I'll be glad to be part of the advisory committee or whatever, but I didn't want to be director. <coughs> well, eventually That's I became forward. director. <laughs> in 2000, I guess, I became director. And that was, in part, I think it became apparent to me at the time that I was going to have to make a choice. That um, the chemistry department had a long tradition of, uh, of a rotating head. And you were due. Was it, <laughs> I was going to be due, and I thought, uh, do I want to do that or would I rather do something that's more collect connected to the research I know about? Because most of chemistry is not in the physical end of chemistry, or at right. least in the materials end of chemistry. It's in the biological, right. uh, organic, yeah. and things that, what, what do I know about that? Nothing, really. So I said the, the lesser of two evils was to be a center director rather than be a department chair. So I became center director and was center director for five years. And, uh, so that was from so that 2000 to? 2000 through 2005. Well, so Melissa uh, has done it for seven years? Melissa will have done it for seven years now. Sure. That's right. And that, that's another interesting story. But anyway, <laughs> so, the, uh, so that was a great time because I got to know all the materials people on campus quite well. I knew quite a few of them sure. anyway because I'm collaborative by nature. Bell Labs makes you collaborative right. by nature. You, you really realize the power of collaboration and working with people who have complementary skills and talents to yours. And also, I mean, Cornell as an institution has really exemplified what it is to be collaborative. As, as universities go, it's certainly, it's, it, uh, I don't think any institution was like Bell Labs. No, and, no, and it had, it had to do with a lot of things because, you know, the university's mission is broadly teaching and research is part of that. Right. Bell Labs was only research. And because of the way the institution grew, uh, there were, there were just simple things like, there was only one dining hall. Everyone went to that dining hall at lunch, and you bumped into people, and you had the most amazing uh, conversations. conversations with people, learning about what was going on. It was an anarchy of ideas. You could join in on ideas. At any one time, I would say, an average scientist at Bell Labs had five different collaborations going, working on five different projects, some of which they may have initiated, or some, some of which someone else initiated, but you found interesting, and you get involved in it, uh, to the extent that you were interested in, or until the 
project completed or something, and then you'd get involved in another one. So, and most of that was not managed by management. It was just this people bumping into each other, intellectual collisions that led somewhere. And uh, no university has yet figured out how to do that on a broad scale, although this adventure with the Atkinson Center for a Sustainable Future is focused on precisely that. How do we, how do we promote intellectual collisions between people across the campus, especially people who... Uh, who typically who, don't talk to each who, other. Huh? Well, especially people who can contribute to sustainability, which is a very broad right. issue of themes in energy, environment, and economic development. Uh, but Cornell, m many academic institutions are, are uh, decentralized, we're delocalized. Um, it's very easy for faculty members on one part of the campus who are working in a specific subject area to not know a faculty member working on another part of the campus working on something similar. Mm -hmm. They have no idea each sure. other exists. And so that, that was the challenge to try to address how do, we, how do we provide the space to do this and then some glue to hold it together so that they can really launch. I don't know if I ever told you <coughs> that I actually came upon your name when I was a postdoc. Ah. Okay. Because I was a postdoc with Al Bard, and we were looking at photoelectrochemistry's transition metal dichalcogen. Oh, yeah. Okay. And there was this little box of, I think it was tungsten disulfide, tungsten diselenide crystals. Yep. I remember FJT Salvo, and I said, must have been the guy who made these things. Little did I know <laughs> that years down the line we would be collaborating. Um, and so if one looks at or lack of a better word, sort of trajectory of research interest. Mm -hmm. I mean, Abelli did a lot of work on charge density waves, transition metal charcogenides here, nitrites, and then fuel cell materials, and nanoparticles. Yeah. How does, in your mind, how does that evolution sort of take place? You know, I think it's just, uh, again, it's kind of the anarchy of ideas. I, I don't, uh, I've never been happy doing the same sort of subject for a long period of time. People have urged me for example, to go back uh, and look at the layered materials, they keep coming up again as right. other. But I, you know, I've done that long enough. I said other people can do that. Um, I, I like to learn new new things and and work with uh, with people who can teach me something. I mean, uh, I still so. remember, you know, the 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 genesis of the Cornell Fuel Cell Institute of Sean's yeah, yeah. Sean Smith's thesis, which is basement adsorbent platinum single crystal surfaces as far as you could get from anything practical. And I still remember when he says, have you considered order in metallics? And you know, with one sentence or one question that ushered this fuel cell institute, which in turn ushered the energy material center. So it's it, one of those sort of serendipitous you know, face yep. of the moon was right and everything. Yeah, was, and I think, it, I think those are very hard to plan, uh, I think. Um, when I look back at, at good collaborations, or I look at good collaborations here at Cornell, it's not only that people have complementary talents, but that they have the, the personality. There's something that clip, clicks in the in the relationship, and then it then it works. And so, uh, for managing the those things, the best a manager can do is to try to get good people with complementary, uh, lots of complementary skills and talents that could connect together and then just tr provide the milieu where those kind of collisions co can occur and you see which ones stick. Right. And then you try to promote the ones that sure. stick. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that's, that's how yeah. many things yeah. happened in sure. my career, I, I would say, that they weren't, they weren't planned and they, it just, ideas come into your head because you hear something from someone and you connect it to something else you know and then boom you're off and running. I mean, we've been collaborating <coughs> I would say closely for over 10 years maybe now? Oh sir, uh, since the fuel cell, yeah. since, since we started that Sean probably graduated around 2000, 2000, 2000 give or take, yeah. And, and that was that thesis. Right. So, so we, years, I, and that was also one of the better deals that I ever made in my life. Oh, I so we're going to make I, we're going to make platinum bismuth, right? Which that. was the compound we wanted to make. And yeah. I, I said so, to you, if you provide the platinum, platinum I can provide I, the bismuth. Provide the I still remember that. I actually have that as a, as a vignette when I talk about the uh, genesis of these things. And I said, you know, and my good colleague Frank Salvo, he's such a generous guy. He says, if you provide the platinum, we'll gladly provide the bismuth. bismuth. Yeah. <laughs> and so. So, but that, that very first sample, it when worked. you looked at it in the lab, just worked just gangbusters. Worked, yeah. And then, uh, so we went, well, you and I went down to DOE together right, to, right. to tell them what happened. 
And that was the only time in my career where they gave us money and we didn't even have to write a grant proposal. Right. They just said, this sounds so interesting, right. here's some money. Right. Um, and and uh, that, that was, that that was, was a wonderful that experience. That was a singularity, for that sure. Was, that was yeah. a singularity. But it has ushered you know, tremendous amount of effort and research support and everything else. Well, and, I mean, you're the, the leading of the Energy Materials Center that at Cornell well. that, that you're doing uh, brought, brought in, I don't know, $20 million. That's so nice. you go back to the genesis of that idea. At the time, we had no idea, of course, that right. it would lead to all right. of that stuff. but it, it's those kinds of seeds that uh, that grow into something that you can't imagine, and that's why you. I think it's very difficult to say this is where my career right, is going to yeah, go sure, or whatever. Sure. All those things happen, and you go left or you go right. So, you know, sort of following <coughs> through that, your. I mean, it seems to me now that your. As the French would say, raison d'être is sustainability. How did you come upon that? Well, I came in from the from the energy side as you right. know from right. being interested but, I mean, in fuel a, cells know, and still you know quite down the line you know well, I had worked on and I'd worked on batteries even at Bell Labs right. they had yeah. worked on materials for batteries some lithium battery uh, stuff early on um, but sustainability from the little that I know is is so broadly encompassing you know it's yeah. even hard to wrap your head around it yeah so in fact I often get asked you know what do you what is sustainability and, uh, and I like an aspirational vision that was, uh, I think, first promulgated by Gro Brundtland in a, in a UN report, the Brundtland Commission. And it and was Brundtland? looking, Brundtland was, uh, she was the, I think, the Prime Minister of uh, oh, Norway. Okay, one of those um, and uh, I don't know whether she was Prime Minister at the time she was on that committee or it was after she'd been Prime Minister. But they made a report and they, they had an aspirational vision for what sustainability was about. And it's, it's very simple, and it's, it's very clear. It doesn't tell you how to get there, but, it's a, but the vision is simple. It says, providing for the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, wow. right? That's so that's, that's, that's very <laughs> profound. Yeah. But, but then you say, okay, now I want to operationalize this. What, what, what am I going to do? So. Um, so what happened here at Cornell was there were a number of committees and Remember task forces. Remember Martin that was put together was, way back. So there was a, there was a, first there was a task force uh, put together by uh, pre then President Lehman. Uh, it was called Task Force on Sustainability in the Age of Development. They did a Cornell-wide report. There was a report in engineering on energy part of sustainability. There was a report in CALS on, CALS, on s what CALS could be doing for sustainability. All this eventually culminated in, uh, at the time, Biddy Martin was provost, uh, and she said, okay, well, it's been all these studies, now what the heck are we going to do? Because the studies said, here's opportunities and right. here's things, but they didn't say, you know, how do we build an organization to do things? So uh, she asked me to uh, chair a small steering committee of half a dozen people to come up with a plan, right. which we, and to report back to her, which we did in about six weeks. And uh, wow, I went back to her and said, you know, what you need to do is to build a, a center with this focus, with the idea of pulling people together across the campus, across discipline. Um, and she said, okay, why don't you be the interim director to get it off the ground? <laughs> I thought, oh, wow. Well, well, so, so I agreed because I thought Again, at the I time. Thought, I said I would never do <laughs> this, right? You know. I thought at the, the idea at the time was that I'd be an interim director to get it started, but that there would be some kind of international search for a director uh, because this, in my opinion, would require someone with a much broader set of, uh, of skills, talents, and interests than, than myself just being a scientist when I knew all the pieces that needed to come together involved social sciences, the humanities, the agriculture and vet and all these things I knew nothing about. Um, anyway, I, I said I would, I would do it. Um, and we operationalized then that, that vision at Cornell by uh, uh, coming up with the idea that sustainability was about the intimate interconnection and interdependence of three big themes, energy, environment, economic development. Right. You could even and, throw in education for a good measure. Well, so where that comes in, almost everyone recognizes a topic that connects to energy. Right. Almost everyone can recognize a topic that connects to environment. 
Economic development, on the other hand, means many things to many people. In our definition, economic development includes certainly enterprise and entrepreneurship, but it's much larger than that. It has everything to do with human well-being. Uh, so education, oh, adequate so food and water, so it's, oh, so it's health, into that, I think. Uh, yeah, health, uh, okay. vibrant institutions, efficient infrastructure, sure. poverty reduction, all of that is in economic development. Sure. So that, when you think of it that way, there's hardly a discipline on campus that doesn't connect to sustainability. And at, oh, sure. at this point... Which makes it even more difficult to, you know, talk about... Right. You know, sure, you know, <laughs> so how do you do this? So it, so it was clear the center had to be yeah. problem focused rather than focused on specific Discipline. di disciplines right. or we didn't think the idea of making something like a school of sustainability was right. That would just make another, you know, another right. unit that was disconnected right. from everything else. What we really wanted to do was to connect together the, the great strong disciplines here at Cornell and be problem focused and, and choose what talents were needed to solve those mm -hmm. particular problems. And that's, that's how that center has gone. It's done very well. We're in our fifth year. Um, we have 270 faculty fellows from, that are associated with 65 departments on the campus. There's only about 100 departments on the campus. Um, oh, and we're growing, <laughs> we're growing, we're still growing <laughs> rapidly. Um, David and Pat Atkinson have endowed the center so that we have a Chuck permanent, Cash, yeah. a, a very, very, un, they're unbelievable people, very, uh, very intelligent, very unassuming, uh, just delightful and generous, of course. And he really is, he's probably the most well-read person I know, maybe next to Glenn Altshuler. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and understands a lot about the challenges that the world faces and really cares that, that the university is doing something about that, that we're addressing the challenge of this century, which is So how do you see the center developing into the future? So I, I think, you know, the, the, the pilot phase is over now that, sure. we're, now that we're endowed. The, the, I'll, I'll, I'll make one point about the endowment. The endowment was, is really huge because in order to have an impact in the world, you have to build connections, collaborations with external organizations. In fact, with all sectors of, of the external world economy, so business, industry, uh, foundations, NGOs, um, private philanthropists, um, you name it, you've got to figure out how uh, to work collectively to bring solutions to the world. The scale of the problems is so huge. Um, universities, even if all the universities banded together to try to solve these problems, it wouldn't be enough. Um, we can make a contribution, but we can't do it without the rest right. of, of, uh, of society. And so the, the, the whole mission then is to first connect internally and then to connect externally. And so we're, we've shown that we can do both at this point. We can connect internally. There's scientists working with humanists, working with people from the vet school or engineering college or from the hotel school, business school, uh, law school. Um, and so the, uh, the, we're limited now mainly just by our own bandwidth and resources to, to put into this. So, so how, do you, how do you decide what to focus on? Because, I mean, talk about a broad parameter. Yes. Yeah. So we don't define things in and out our, ourselves. What we try to do is uh, to encourage people to come to us with what they think yes. are interesting problems in sustainability space. We have annual competitions. Okay. We seed those efforts. Uh, so we've had... Uh, uh, about 130 proposals for seed funds. We were able to fund 35. Oh, those uh, are pretty good. So that's not too bad. Uh, although I, I think there were ones that we couldn't fund that would have been, would have been terrific to fund. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have funded all of them. I, I don't think. Uh, yeah, the, but the whole process, almost every one of those uh, grants involves. Uh, faculty from different colleges. I would assume uh, and that almost, it has to involve, and, right, and or not? Typically, it has to be, typically has to be multidisciplinary. Right. It's strongly preferred. It typically has to be faculty that haven't worked together before. It can't be just sort of adding on to right. what's already going on. There's no, we don't add any value doing that. The value comes in connecting people sure. together that haven't been connected before sure. to allow them to, to address something that you couldn't address otherwise. Um, and that's, that's really what's worked very well. 
So we've, we've spent, since the beginning, on everything, including my part of my salary and all of that, we spent about $10 million, yeah, $10 million I'd mm -hmm. say, in somewhat under five years. But the teams that we've seeded have brought in about $90 million. So wow. they, they, they've been very successful by showing uh, proof of principle or collecting initial data or sometimes just showing that they're really working together as a team is sufficient for them to go to the front of the line with these interactions with mm -hmm. external organizations and they so that's a 10 to 1 average. Them. That's not bad. That's not bad. That's not bad. <laughs> Maybe 9 to 1, but, but still. Rough if, numbers. Yeah, if, 10 if, I could, 10. if I could invest my own money at that kind of rate of return, <laughs> really? yeah. I'd, I'd, be, uh, I'd, be, I'd be pouring a lot of money into it. So now we're trying to grow the whole enterprise and to think about uh, what other programs we can do to, to help connect people together and to help connect them with the external How world. How difficult is it to manage <clears> this? Well, it, uh, it's not difficult. It's very time consuming. Okay. I don't think any of it is rocket science. Okay. It's time consuming uh, because getting people together involves a lot of face time. Yeah. Uh, it involves talking to, to people. It's getting people. It's getting people to understand what it is we're trying to do. When teams that we seed succeed, we don't manage them. Right? I, I, we don't have the bandwidth to do it. I don't have the intelligence right. to do it. Uh, they, they launch. They're on their own. They can stay connected with us if they like, and almost all have in some way or other. Um, but our, our idea is just to seed things and Cornell benefits, but we don't, we don't take any, anything back from the teams that succeed. We don't try to manage them. We just are so an incubator. So now that you have an endowment, you don't have to worry about sort of maintaining this, but was there any you know, proposal to get you know, a fraction of the overhead from efforts you know, to so we're, so we're working on the business model, has, how the business right. model right. ought to be evolving. It's clear the Atkinson Julie, gift, you know, as I said, right. is very important. It provides a strong base, right. but it's very clear that the scale of the problems and the scale of the opportunities uh, at bigger. Cornell are much bigger, so right. we need to grow. And we're working with alumni affairs and development and with uh, individual philanthropists and others uh, to help grow the activity, to help grow the resources to, to expand this further. What fraction of your time is on quote unquote fundraising, you know, with alumni or whatever? That's an increasing fraction. <laughs> Which it's brings a, us also, you now <clears throat> face retirement or at halftime, what exactly do you have right now? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I've just started uh, a, a phased retirement. Uh, mm -hmm. And this was really just to give me more time to spend on the, on the center. Um, so my wife has pointed out to me that I'm on phased retirement salary-wise, but time-wise, that hasn't <laughs> made any difference. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, this, uh, this is a really new way for the university, I think, to, to help organize addressing world problems. Um, in a collective way, in a way that we hope will have significant world impact. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm delighted at how well it's going, and I'm, it's, I've learned so much. It's been like Bell Labs. It's been an anarchy of ideas. There's been so many people I've met from every college on the campus that are very smart, very motivated. Everybody gets sustainability. You don't have yeah, to, you right, know, you don't have people to. understand we've got a big challenge. The students get it. They know it's about their sure. future and they think their future's in doubt. Right. The alumni get it. They're out in the world. They see what's going on in the world and they know we, we gotta, we've got to change things. The faculty even get it. There just wasn't a mechanism to get the faculty right. together. Um, and that's, that's all that we're doing. It's not, not more than that. You need very strong disciplines to draw from. You need a great talent pool and then you got to start pulling them together. We got those first parts and it's just paying attention to pulling them together. So how do you go from sort of Ithaca centric to world centric? How do you make that transition? So that's really through connecting with the with outside uh, that's organizations. Cornell mostly time consuming. That's also time consuming. So building, you know, as you what we want to build with larger organizations are strategic partnerships. I can tell you a lot about that, but that would be getting a feel. The we do have because of extension and because of a lot of uh, international work and international development work that's gone at Cornell, we do have some feet on the ground in various places around the planet and connections to either governments or other organizations that, uh, uh, that are a good base to work from. Mm -hmm. So we have projects, for example, that we funded that are going to be doing work in Kenya 
uh, or uh, uh, other parts of the world in, in uh, Central America or here mm -hmm. or there, uh, as well as local and, and U.S. So it's, sustainability is not a, is not a, an, an issue that um, is, uh, is just localized. It's local, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's national, you know, it's, it's world, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's on every local, scale. Yeah, right. It's on every scale. It's almost, uh, so so we, we are defined now by what it is we do, not by saying, you know, we'll, we're going to solve this, right. you know, we're going to include these people, but not these people. Right. Anybody can put in ideas. Anybody can compete and, and try and will help build teams, will help uh, connect people. So I think of ourselves as, a, as an initiator, a connector, a convener, an incubator. That's sort of the, that's mm -hmm. sort of the scale of which we try to do things. And then it flies or it doesn't. That's what we do. So what does the crystal ball hold? <clears throat> I have no <laughs> idea. I've never had any idea. But I certainly could say... To quote uh, I, I could Yogi Bear. <laughs> I could certainly say I had no idea that I would end up uh, here doing what I'm doing in, in the balance of the times that I'm spending on sustainability versus my own research or other things. Um, it's just evolved, uh, and uh, we just work hard at it and, uh, and, and try to uh, plan for success the best we can, and we'll see how it turns out. Also plan for failure, too, at some level. Well, we try to learn from failure, and those things that don't work well, we stop doing. Yeah. And, uh, and say, okay, that's not working, and let's do something time. else. Right. Uh, and, and I don't do that myself. That's the other, the other important difference between being, say, director of CCMR the director in principle makes, makes most of the decisions with some advice from the faculty advisory board at, at the Atkinson Center. We have a leadership team of seven people, four faculty and three uh, um, scientific staff people uh, that, that we rely on to make decisions. So most decisions, especially of any consequence, are made by that team. And then we have retreats twice a year to look at the programs, how they're doing, what's effective, what's not effective, what new things can we initiate, what things can we stop doing. Um, and we have another one coming up soon. Um, and it's, it's as important to, to decide what not to spend your time on as, as it is to sure. figure and out what it is you do yeah, I mean, and, and resources. Limited, yeah. And so that's, that's always, a, it's always sure. a, an interesting struggle. But I have, the, the leadership team is so good. We work together extremely well now. They're, they're, it's a very effective team for making decisions. Um, I couldn't I couldn't possibly have done it myself. Sure. Well, it's a, it's a, been a been a huge adventure. And maybe there's a good place to stop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Where oh, are we at? <clears throat> okay, big guy. Thank you, Tito. <laughs>